So as you know, Pastor Joshua is away on leave and he'll be back in, um, not next week, but the following week. But today we have the pleasure of having Pastor John come in us to come to the pulpit and give us your word. Thank you. Hey, you're, you're getting away. I don't want you to get away. Come on back. And that one here, and the other one, bless me. Okay, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we we pray for Pastor John Comino, so you'll be able to speak through him, that your words will um, resonate through him. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you'll be able to fill him with your spirit, and he's about to speak your word, Lord Jesus. I just pray that his words will be able to touch each one of us, dear Lord, um, help us to understand your message today and to be able to make an impact in our lives today. Lord Jesus, we want to be the salt and the light of this world. And without your word, without your influence, without your spirit, we cannot move uh, one step forward, dear Lord. I just pray that you'll be able to fill us with your grace, with your spirit, that you'll be able to challenge us today to know the reason why we're here today and what influence we can make out there in the world as you continuously walk this path with us, with your spirit, dear Lord. I just pray that your spirit will be with us, that you be able to anoint Pastor John Comino to say the words that you're meant to say today. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was a brilliant prayer. Thank you very much. Joshua assigned me, you know, Joshua is off having a holiday. He's not. He works all the time. Even his holidays are working. So he assigned me, I can do 1 Corinthians 15 or 16. It just so happens 1 Corinthians 15 is one of my very favorite chapters in the Bible. So I'm going to give it to you today. And I told him, we were texting backwards and forwards, and I said, Joshua, I'll take 15, and I'll take the entire chapter. And he thought I was joking because we joke a lot on our text messages. I'm not joking. You're getting the whole chapter. And my wife is going to keep me honest. She's going to tell me when 30 minutes is up. And you're saying to yourself, what will happen at 30 minutes? Nothing. I will keep going. I will keep going. I had a wonderful opportunity last week to go to... Uh, Mimi Lee's place in the Gold Coast, speak to the Gold Coast Heartbeat Church. I loved it. I've never seen a golfing uh, instruction, what do you call that? A golfing academy pretending to be a church before. But actually what they are is they're a church pretending to be a golfing academy. That is an unbelievable setup. It's incredible. And here we have Judy and Joanna who tried to avoid me last week, but they have to hear me this week, even though they weren't at Gold Coast last week. Went to Melbourne. I love that. And the setting up there is high up in a, one of the skyscrapers next to the casino. I could see right through the CBD of Melbourne. Unbelievable. People were lovely, and I am really thankful to God for his kindness in giving me an opportunity to speak to you. I love to reveal Jesus Christ to people. It's my honor to do that because he is so loving, he's so kind, and he doesn't talk much about himself. Do you know the scripture says, Let the proverb says this, let another man praise you, don't do it with your own lips. And that's why all of us have a calling on our lives that when we have the opportunity, we get a chance to talk about him. He won't talk about himself. And he relies upon us to talk about him. But that's an honor. It's a wonderful thing to do. So let's wade into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we can put it up here on the board. I'm going to push this out of the way so you can see it a little better. 1 Corinthians 15. If you've been to seminary, you'll know that you probably get taught that this is the resurrection chapter, and it's for good reason, because it's really fundamental to the entire concept of our future, the resurrection of the dead. I want to read, I've got a, um, a scripture I want to read before we get into this, 
And it's one that I have used in every funeral I've ever done. I've done a lot of them. And this is First Thessalonians chapter 4. So if you want to follow along in your um, iPhones, whatever you have there for a Bible, it's First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. First Thessalonians, what did I say? Oh, that. First Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself, will descend from heaven with a shout. He came the first time, he didn't come with a shout. He came quietly. He was the Lamb of God. Came to die for our sins. When he comes back, he comes back as the Lion, the Messiah. And he comes back with a shout. And he'll come back with the voice of the archangel and with God's trumpet. If you go in the book of Revelation, you'll find this is this particular trumpet is the seventh trumpet. And it's a sound down to the return of Messiah and the revelation of Jesus as the ruler of the earth. We know he's ruling now, but the devil is allowed to hide that unless you're being called by God to come to Jesus. The dead in Christ will rise first. I don't know how much longer I've got to go. So I joke about it. But Part of it's true that every morning I get up, I look around for the bits that fell off through the night. <laughs> when you're growing older, you're decaying. I'm sorry, I can't make it any more attractive than that. And you're headed for the grave, and I'm about done with this body anyhow. I want what's coming. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. So first thing that happens as Jesus returns is that the dead Christians are raised up out of their graves, and we're headed somewhere. We come up out of our graves, but we have a new body. We don't have this old one. We have a new body, an eternal body that will never get sick, never run out of energy, I was really challenged last weekend um, catching these flights up to the Gold Coast and then down to Melbourne. And I don't know why it is, but domestic terminals, it doesn't matter where they are, the flight that I have is always about a kilometre out there somewhere from the entrance of the place. <laughs> and then I had some stairs to go up to get into the aircraft. And, boy, I really, I must be terribly out of shape. But by the end of the weekend, I was doing much better. It's good exercise. The dead rise first. Then we who are alive and are left. So when Jesus returns, if we're alive at that time, we're transformed. We don't die. We're transformed, given the new eternal bodies. And this is what 1 Corinthians 15 has to deal with because in 1 Corinthians 15, there were people in the church who were sowing heresy and saying, well, there's no resurrection. The resurrection's passed. And Paul says, hey, if there's no resurrection, Jesus is dead and we don't have a faith. Christianity is a fraud. But we'll see that in just a moment. Back in 1 Thessalonians 4, he said, We who are alive will be caught up together with in the church to meet the Lord in the air, so will we be with the Lord forever. And some people have looked at that. They look at it with, their, um, what do you call that, blinkers on that horses have. To, people don't want horses to see what's happening on the sides. So they put blinkers on. And we could look at Scripture like that sometimes. And just focus on that one scripture and forget everything else in the Bible. That scripture is not saying that we're going to be in the clouds with Jesus forever because Jesus is coming down through the clouds to the earth. And when we're caught up with him, it's so that we can arrive together where he's headed. And we're going to see that as the talk goes on here. So can we go back to 1 Corinthians 15 now, please? I took this from the Web Translation, World English Bible. It's really the American Standard Version that's been updated. The really good thing about it is it's free. I love free things. But it's a good translation. Now I declare to you, brothers, this is 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 1, the good news which I preached to you, 
by the way, the word gospel, the word gospel is good news. It's a Greek word. It means good news. The message we have is good news because we're talking about our brother Jesus which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved. A lot of translations, you may have one in front of you now, says are being saved. Absolutely wrong. I don't know where they got that from. You're saved, and that's what the Greek says. The verb is present tense. You are saved. You're not being saved. You're saved. It's accomplished. It's done. Jesus did it on the cross. You are saved if you hold firmly the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So what Paul is saying here is the center of our belief as Christians. It's eternal life. It's resurrection. Jesus bought it by his love and he paid the price with the life of God himself. So how could somebody in the Corinthian church say, oh, resurrection's past. There isn't anything after that. This is all about our eternal life. We are saving up treasures in heaven. Let's continue, please. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Paul is saying, I gave you the straight stuff. What I got from Jesus, I'm giving to you. What these heretics are doing is something else. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried and he was raised up on the third day according to the Scriptures. Next verse, please. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's, of course, Peter's original Jewish name, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers at once, most of whom remain, most are still alive while I'm writing this, Paul was saying, but some had died, fallen asleep. Paul wasn't worried about death because to him and for us Christians, it's just like going to sleep. We do it every night. In a sense, we die, we go to sleep, we wake up in the morning. Because there is resurrection, because we have eternal life as a gift, for us, death is not an end. It's just falling asleep. Okay. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as if to a child born at the wrong time, he appeared to me. And you know it. He appeared to Paul, Jesus did on the road to Damascus, and then Paul for three years was taught by Jesus. And I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the assembly of God, the church. Next one. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace which was given to me was not futile. It wasn't wasted. But I work more than all of them. And Paul's not boasting while he says that. It's just a, a Donald Trump moment. He's being honest about himself. He worked harder than all the rest. That's what godly sorrow does. If you're sorry for what you've done, then it convicts you to work harder. He never did what Judas Iscariot did. Judas was sorry, but Judas went out and hung himself. That was selfish dysfunctional sorrow. Yet not I, it wasn't me who did the work, but the grace of God which was with me. Isn't that great? That's what saved him from having a swelled head and being vain. He was humble. And he said it was God who did it. Whether then it's I or they, so we preach and so you believe. So he said it doesn't matter whether it's the apostles who got it directly from Jesus as they ministered with him or me who got it separately but directly from Jesus, you're getting the same thing. The resurrection is what you're getting. Now, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then neither has Christ been raised. That's inescapable logic, isn't it? Next one. 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain, which means empty and useless. Yes, we're found false witnesses of God because we testified about God that he raised up Christ, 
The 12 apostles, one of the callings on their life was they had to be people who had seen Jesus. They saw him. They saw him uh, go to the cross. They saw him when he was resurrected and came back to life. So there were witnesses to the resurrection. The resurrection is the thing that proves Jesus was the Son of God. He overcame death. If he had been a fake Messiah, when he died, that would have been it. But the Father raised him up. Yes, we found false witnesses of God because we testified about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did raise up, didn't raise up, if it is so that the dead are not raised. So I think Paul's making this plain. 16 says, for if the dead aren't raised, neither has Christ been raised. If Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is vain. You're still in your sins. Then they also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. You'll never see them again. If we have only hoped in Christ in this life, we are of all men most pitiable. If there is no resurrection, why do we go through the trials that we do for Jesus? There's no purpose for it. Because there's every purpose for it because he was resurrected. Let's keep going. Um, but now Christ has been raised up from the dead. This is verse 20. He became the first fruits of those who are asleep. He is the model for all of us that, that had to come afterwards. What's happened to him, what he looks like, is what we are going to be. He's the test pilot for what the Father is doing. And it's a whole new generation, this time not of flesh and blood children of God, but of spiritual children of God, with bodies, but imperishable, perfected. I believe, I'll leave the scripture for a moment. My understanding of God is that he loves creativity, diversity. Look around you at all the different faces. Even brothers and sisters don't look, um, brothers and, with other brothers, where your DNA is almost the same, you look different. God is an infinite God. I don't think in the resurrection that we're all going to look exactly like Jesus. I don't think God's in the business of cloning Jesus. I think he loves diversity. But nevertheless, we will have the same heart as Jesus. That's what's important. And God doesn't clone that. You've got to grow that by your relationship with him. I think what we're going to see when we get resurrected is we're going to look like ourselves now, but perfected. Hmm? This is where you can take out a little mirror and look at yourself and figure out what are the bits you don't like. Because that's not a part of God's original plan for you. He makes the place where he sets his feet, this Hebrew expression about where he lives, glorious. He makes it glorious. You are going to be glorious. You're going to share in the glory of Jesus. Do you know what that means? You're going to be awesomely beautiful. Oh, excuse me, fellas, handsome. You're going to be perfected. I might even get some hair back again. Okay, verse 20. It's raised from the dead. He became the first fruits of those who were asleep. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. Ooh. Wow. For since death came by man, the resurrection of the dead also came by man. For as in Adam all die, that's Adam's legacy. He disobeyed God, distrusted him, walked away from him, and introduced decay and death. You know, in one sense, I don't have so much of a problem with death. If we were just healthy up until the moment, we fall over like a budgie falls off its perch. It's Australian, have to be an Australian to understand that. When you've fallen off your perch, you've died. 
That would be good, but what happens to us, and this happened at the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve walked away from God. Decay came into creation. From that moment, Adam and Eve were running down, decay, growing old. That, I think, hurts even more than the falling off the perch. I hate to see people with diseases of old age like dementia, where their minds go someplace. My mother had that for 10 years before she finally died. My mother was such an intelligent, lively person. I hate decay. Sometimes to me, death is a release from the decay. Resurrection sets all that right. Now, as explained here in verse 21, death came by man, that's Adam. The resurrection came by man, Jesus Christ, a man who just happened to be our creator God as well. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So all human life descends from Adam and his wife Eve. But all life of the children of God, that immortal bodies that we have, when we become the sons of God for all eternity, that will come from Jesus Christ. Next verse, 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming. Then the end comes. So you see a process here. Those who are changed into the future man, the spirit man, First Jesus, then the saints when Christ comes back. As it says in verse 23, those who are Christ's at his coming, we're changed. And in a moment we'll see, what about the others who aren't Christians? Then it says, then the end comes when he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he will have abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he's put all the enemies under his feet. Okay, next verse. 26, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. That was the problem that was released, the curse from the Garden of Eden. And Jesus is reversing the curse. I'd like one of those little political hats if I was running for office. It would say, reverse the curse. Make Australia great again. Uh, How would I get that? <laughs> Where is it? No, I... I'd rather have make Australia great under Jesus. That would be a great head. Verse 27, for he put all things in subjection under his feet, but when he says all things are put in subject subjection, it's evident that he is accepted who subjected all things to him. In other words, Jesus does at no stage is going to claim rulership over his father. The Godhead is one. They are undivided. They play different roles. And Jesus is submitted to the will of his Father, and he does it with all his heart. He doesn't do it begrudgingly. Next. When all things have been subjected to him, then the Son will also himself be subjected to him, who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. Or else what will they do who are baptized for the dead, if the dead aren't raised at all? Now, we probably don't have a problem just reading that for what it says. If you're baptized for the dead, it means when you get baptized, you're looking forward to the resurrection. Otherwise, why do you get baptized? What does baptism signal? Now, I know that you are holy sprinklers, heartbeat. But I am Greek, and in Greek, the word for baptism is baptismos, which means to be totally immersed in water. Now, I have no problem with sprinkling. I've even put some mud on people's heads when there was no water around. It's symbolic of cleansing. And what we need to understand is the meaning of baptism rather than argue over whether we should sprinkle or dunk. The full symbolism, however, is in immersion, which is what baptismos means. Because you go down into your grave. When you go down into the water or you have water sprinkled on your head, it symbolizes your death. 
Then when you come up out of the water, it symbolizes what? Your resurrection. That's why I'm astonished that there was a group in the church that was teaching there is no resurrection. It's what our faith is all about. Resurrection is our hope. That's why we die in that water of cleansing, in our grave. It's a watery grave. So uh, that's what he's talking about here. Um, baptized for the dead means that when we get baptized, it's because we're looking forward to eternal life and the resurrection. I will warn you, however, there is a group of people come around, knock on your door. Not the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's the other variety, the Mormons. I think they're lovely people. Their elders, are, oftentimes their faces are covered in pimples and they're age 18. But they have a little badge that tells you they're an elder. Good luck to them. They have a lot of zeal. For that zeal, they are to be commended, but they, they don't have truth in this area because what they teach is that if you go back through your ancestry, that's why they're big on ancestry. If you've ever gone to their uh, website, ancestry.com.au, that's where you go through your DNA. I've taken the DNA test to try and find out who my ancestors are. That's a Mormon thing. Now, why they've got such an obsession about your ancestry is that they believe if you find out who your great, 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 great grandmother was, you can use her name, you can go into the temple, and you can stand in for her and be baptized as a Mormon, even though she maybe died 150 years ago, and she can be saved retroactively by your faith. That's bunk. Okay? It's, this scripture cannot be used to prove that. But it's still good to know who your great-great-grandmother was. Or else what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead aren't raised at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Why do we also stand in jeopardy every hour? Why are we going through hell on earth if there is no resurrection is what Paul is telling us. Okay, next verse, please. I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If I fought with animals at Ephesus for human purposes, what does it profit me if the dead are not raised? I may as well say, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You know that feeling, don't you? My generation, so I was at university in the 60s, we were the ones that revolted against the older generation. And we said, hey, man, if it feels good, do it. That was the theme of my generation. So take LSD, go for a trip. Oh, great, man. If it feels good, do it. Take marijuana, it's great. Have sex indiscriminately outside of marriage. Hey, man, if it feels good, do it. Let me tell you, you, you reap the whirlwind when you sow that. So here Paul is saying, if there is no Jesus, if there's no resurrection, well, let's just enjoy ourselves now to the max. And that's the attitude of atheists, and it's part of the problem why the world is the way it is. Don't be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. He's warning the church, don't hang around with people who lack Christian values. Please, next one. Wake up righteously and don't sin. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He's picking out those people. You bet the people in the congregation who said there's no resurrection were chasing that type of a spiritual life, the one lack of spiritual life, the one that says if it feels good, let's do it, man. Let's throw a party now because there's no tomorrow. So Paul is being very accurate in what he says. Someone will say, how are the dead raised? Ha! Huh. What does a resurrected body look like? We've never seen one. Paul had. He saw Jesus. Jesus got right in his face. And with what kind of body do they come? So now people are getting into the technical details. This is science against faith. I want to know the facts here. You foolish one. <laughs> that which you yourself sow is not made alive unless it dies. Okay, next one, please. That which you sow, you don't sow the body that will be, but you put in the ground a bare, dry, dead kernel of wheat, let's say. 
But what pops up out of the ground, if you water the ground, is something that looks totally different from what was sown. So our spiritual bodies are going to be very different from these old, decaying physical bodies that we have. But God gives it a body even as it pleases him, and to each seed a body of its own. Let's continue on, please. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one flesh of men, another of animals, another of fish, of birds. There are also celestial bodies, that's heavenly bodies, and earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial differs from that of the terrestrial. God has the ability to make different creations. That shouldn't come as a surprise for us. Next. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. God is an infinite creator. He doesn't lack the ability to give us something the world has not seen. This is what God has been preparing from before the beginning of time. God has seen us as his eternal children covered in glory, a new creation. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown perishable, but it's raised imperishable. There is no use by date for a son of God. You won't grow old, bits won't fall off, and you'll be perfect. Next. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it has raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. So also it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. There is a first Adam and there's a second Adam. And I want to take a break uh, here for a moment. I don't have time to go through this in detail, but I've got a whole teaching on the bride of Jesus, and it applies whether you're male or female. Why? Because the bride of Jesus is the church. So it doesn't matter how macho you are, fellas. Symbolically, you're a bride of Jesus. Just like you ladies, you're sons of God, whether you're male or female. Those things don't matter. It's a title. So here's a first Adam and a second Adam. And the Holy Spirit started asking me a question one day. I love it when he asks me questions because when he asks questions, I know I'm going to get the answer. Sometimes it's taken years before I get the answer, but I know I'm going to get it. And he said, okay, there's a first Adam. And the first Adam had a wife called Eve. Wasn't that so? And he said, there's a second Adam. Who is his wife. Well, there's a second Eve, isn't there? Who is the wife, the bride of Jesus? It's the church. Now, the first Adam could not fulfill his calling without the first Eve, because his calling was to what? Fill the earth with other human beings, to reproduce, and to take care of the gut. I think what God had in mind was that as more human beings came into existence, the Garden of Eden would spread till it filled the whole earth. And God gave Adam and Eve as much as they could take care of in the original garden. But Adam, before Eve was created, he's got this calling on his life to reproduce and fill the earth, and there's no way he could do it. See, without you ladies... This is the last generation of human beings that will ever live. You have that miraculous ability in your bodies to nurture life. Oh, we may help you start it, and that's no effort, is it, fellas? No, it's actually a lot of fun. You get to do the hard work. I love the way God has planned things out. I would not like to have a baby. My wife gets very hostile when she's giving birth. She seems to blame me for it all. I'm getting into trouble, so I'd better move on. God needs you, the bride. Jesus needs you, otherwise he can't fulfill the calling his father's given him. The father's calling on Jesus' life is the same calling that was put on Adam's life you reproduce my children. 
The Father has asked the Son to do that, and he needs, Jesus needs the church to be able to do that. How many minutes is that? 30. Okay. I'll ignore you now. Okay. Does that make sense to you? I hope so. Whoop. Trip over things. Now, I'm not saying that in the sense that Jesus is limited. Jesus, the Father, choose to use us. What an honor that they have given us a principal position in their plan for all eternity. They're dependent upon us, not because they're weak, but because they love us and they love to share. And they're saying, welcome to the family. There's no family without you. All our hopes are pinned on you. Boy, I don't want to let them down. The church is the mother of us all. Interestingly enough, Paul uses that expression in Galatians. He says the heavenly Jerusalem is the mother of all, and that was the name that Adam gave to his wife, the mother of all. That's what Eve means, Chava, life. Okay, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's in verse 45. However, that which is spiritual doesn't come first, but that which is natural. Then comes the spiritual. That's the way God models things. First he models them in clay, in the ground, and then he models it in spirit, in reality. No longer temporary, but perfected. That's what God is doing with us. Next verse, please. First man is of the earth. Made of the dust, Adam means red clay, red dirt. The second man is the Lord from heaven, it's Jesus. As is the one made of dust, such are those who are also made of dust. In other words, Adam reproduces after his kind. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. All of us who come from Jesus, he is our husband, but he is the first fruits. We look like him. We are going to look like him, perfected, filled with love, filled with glory, and honor, and power. As we have borne, this is verse 49, the image of those made of dust, let's also bear the image of the heavenly. That's what we're looking forward to in the resurrection. Next verse. Now I say this, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom. Why? Because... We're not built for all eternity. Neither does the perishable inherit imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. It's not going to be a painful metamorphosis like you see the butterflies coming out of the chrysalis. First they're a, a grub, and then they form a chrysalis with a shell around them, and then they break out of that shell and got to spread their wings. And at first, their wings of the butterflies are very fragile and wet, and they've got to wait until they dry before they can fly off. We are going to have a metamorphosis greater than any butterfly, but it will happen in a twinkling of an eye. And when you come up out of your grave, or you're alive and you're changed, the first thing you will see is a guardian angel standing by you who will lift you up and escort you to Jesus who is coming down through the clouds. I don't know. I'm glad my guardian angel is going to be there because I've got no idea how to rise up like Jesus does. That's one of the first things that's going to happen. Forget Superman. He's weak. What we're going to become is greater than anything any man has imagined because what we're going to become is what God has imagined. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Please keep going. For this perishable body must become imperishable, this mortal must put on immortality, but when this perishable body will have become imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then what is written will happen. Death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus defeats death. 
He overturns what the devil did and will wipe the smile off the devil's face forever. Please. Death, where is your sting? Are this is Greek word, meaning the grave. Where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He takes away the penalty for breaking the law. Next. Thank you. Verse 20, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor is not in vain. It's not a waste in the Lord. Okay. Huh. We can end there. I don't need the screen any longer. I want to talk to you. How much time do I have, Chris? What's that mean? How many minutes have I gone? Because Joshua's going to see this. He's going to know if I've gone too long. Is I gone 40 minutes? Okay. i got to get this in. Do you mind? I can see one or two of you saying, no, sit down, you old man. Heard too much from you. I want to say that. In the Old Testament, God had a covenant, a covenantal name with his people. He married Israel. And the name he had was, well, some people pronounce it Yahweh. Some say Yahweh. We really don't know what the vowels were. They've been lost purposely because the Jews don't want us saying that name. It's a holy name. And they give it a Greek name because it's four letters in Hebrew. They say that's the Tetragrammaton. Sounds like something out of Transformers, doesn't it? Awesome, the Tetragrammaton. And it's those four letters. What does it mean? Does anybody know? Can you tell me? What does Yahweh mean? Come on, I've heard the Koreans don't really know their scriptures. I want this. I need this. Look, my wife's ready to put her hand up and shame you all. She's German-American. What does she know? <laughs> Tetra, uh, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, and I don't blame you for not answering because it's a very complex thing. I'm going to put it simply. It is the I am. Now, what does that mean? I exist. I'll give it to you another way, the simplest way I know. I am life. See, when you go up and shake hands with Jesus, and I think he's more like me, he'll give you a hug. But when you meet him, you're meeting life itself or himself. He's the creator. Everything exists because of him. Wouldn't that take your breath away? Now, he's talking with the Jewish religious leaders who hated him. And they were discussing about Abraham. And at one stage, they said, they were accusing him of blasphemy. They did it twice in John chapter 8. And at one stage, he said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, that's not good English grammar, is it? Because if you're just talking about who lived before Abraham, he would say, before Abraham was, I existed or I lived. But he says, before Abraham was, I am. He was saying the name of God. That's why, if you notice when he said it, the first thing they did was they picked up rocks to kill him because he was blaspheming. He was saying that he was the Tetragrammaton. He was the creator. He was life itself. And you know, you can't keep life dead. And 1 Corinthians 15 ends by telling us that life will triumph over death. Jesus is going to kill life, kill death, sorry. He will kill death. <laughs> There's so much life. You can't stop him. You can't kill him. He's unstoppable. May I bless you. I bless you, my brothers and sisters. I bless you with the blessing that comes from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of life. May you come to life 
May you come to that place where you rise up in the glory of the resurrection. That's your legacy. It's your inheritance from Jesus Christ, the giver of life, the one who is full of life. He's so full of life, he can't be killed. He can't be held in the grave. He's full of life. He's full of joy. He's full of love. And he wants to fill you up with his unstoppable life. And I bless you that you will turn your back on the dead one, the decaying one, the devil, and that you won't allow his thoughts and his depression to get into your hearts. He's depressed because he knows nothing's going to work out for him and that Jesus is going to conquer, that life is returning to God's creation through the church and through Jesus Christ. So I bless you. Let the life of God rise up in you now and forever. Be filled with the joy and the love of your life-giving Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.